So last week, um, we were looking at the story of Jesus' encounter with some religious leaders, and we saw how Jesus criticised them for their, uh, their obsession with the law, uh, with their obsession with legalism at the expense of everything else. And it would be very easy to read a story like that and come to the conclusion that, uh, or, or take away a very negative view of the law. And so I thought this afternoon we'd look at a chapter in the Bible which says a lot of positive things about God's law. It's the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. Um, you'll be pleased that, to know that we're not going to read the whole thing, 170 whatever it is, verses, uh, but we're just going to read the first 16 verses and then we're going to do something a little bit later with the rest of that book. Uh, if you've got a, a, a paper Bible in front of you, and maybe even if you've got a Bible app on your phone, uh, you might be able to see um, that Psalm 119 is laid out in chunks of eight verses. So there are 22 lots of eight verse sections. And if you've got, again, depending on the app you've got on your phone or if you've got a paper Bible, um, you'll see that each of those uh, is headed with a different letter from the Hebrew Bible. And you will also see from the footnote that Psalm 119 is an acrostic poem. Now, does anyone know what that means? Anyone know what we mean when we say it's an acrostic? Oh, there's a word. All I can see is a hand above the screen at the back. Was that a hand? Yeah. Okay, what does that mean then? Yeah, so if you were to have, you could have an acrostic poem where you had a, say you had Combaton Baptist Church down the left hand side, and then the first line of the poem would start with C, the second line would start with O, the th uh, third one would start with M, and so on. But um, <coughs> Psalm 119 um, is an acrostic poem. Now, obviously, it was written in Hebrew, and I'm not expecting you to work out what the, I'm just, this is just for, uh, just to show, it's easier to show you. And remember that Hebrew reads from right to left. So the first letter of the first, even if you can't read what it is, you can recognize that the first letter of the first eight verses is the same shape. And that's the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Then the next eight all begin with the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and then the third section, the third letter, etc., etc., etc. So if you've got a Bible with headings and you want to know what your Hebrew alphabet is, you can just read it off from the headings. So Aleph, Bet, etc., etc., etc. Now, if you were a Jew, uh, of course, you would memorize massive chunks of the Hebrew Bible. And so this is helpful for memorization if you were, if you could read it in Hebrew because you know right I've got to think of eight lines that all start with A and then once you've and then it's the next chunk all start with B etc etc so let's read <clears throat> the first 16 verses now obviously the acrostic part doesn't work in English at all <clears throat> and blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. 
I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Uh, if you've read your bulletin, you will know that I have chosen or have called today's uh, the theme for today's uh, talk, The Bible, The Wrong Kind of Book. Slightly provocative title, uh, but I'm hoping that those of you that have known me for a little while uh, will know that my answer to that question is almost certainly going to be no. It's not the wrong kind of book, it's the right kind of book because it's what God in his wisdom has chosen to give us. Uh, on Friday I had an email, uh, one of those kind of annoying emails that I seem to get every Friday uh, from companies that you've maybe you've purchased something from them or you've entered some details on their website or something like that. And 99% um, of their emails are annoying and a waste of time, but there's always that chance that there's that 1% that might be really useful. So you never get around to pressing unsubscribe because you might find something helpful at some point. And uh, <coughs> on Friday, I had this an email advertising these two books, The Science of Climbing Training and The Cycling Bible. Um, I don't cycle and I don't climb. Um, but I also had emails on Friday for coffee, uh, a range of theological books, uh, afternoon tea, an advert for a spa day, kitchen electricals, loft ladders, and a whole range of board games. But I want to particularly draw your attention to the cycling Bible. Because when we talk about the Bible, we think we're, we're talking about this book um, here. But the word Bible, as a word, it comes from Greek and it comes through Latin roots, and it simply means books. Uh, or scrolls. And so in uh, this verse in 2 Timothy chapter 4 where Paul is saying, send my scrolls, the word there is this same word that we, the root that comes through the word Bible. And so in addition to kind of our specific use of the word Bible to talk about this book, um, it can also be used to talk about any book that is kind of considered to be authoritative uh, so whatever your own personal interest is, there's probably a Bible to go with it. So whether it's um, ultra marathon running, or growing fruit and veg, uh, or photography, there is a Bible to go with whatever your interest may be. But the, one of the main differences between this Bible and let's say the cycling Bible um, is that when you pick up the cycling Bible, you're not necessarily expecting to read the whole thing. You're hoping that there's an index in the back that can tell you which page to look at when you, if you've got a specific question. Um, and then when you turn to that page, you're hoping that it's got some bullet points and it's got some instructions, maybe it's got some photographs, it might even have a QR code link to some YouTube videos. So if, for example, you were wanting to know how to change your brakes, uh, there'd probably be a section in there on brakes, and there'd be one little section that you'd look at if you had kind of the old fashioned uh, block brakes that just kind of grip the wheel. Uh, there might be another section that if you have disc brakes, uh, and you would hope that if this book is well written, you can find what you want really quickly and stop reading and get on with the rest of your life. So when I'm, for example, trying to find out something, so last week on, I was wanted to know video editing, how do I remove the echo? Because when I record on my phone, there's an echo that I try to remove. How do I remove that in DaVinci Resolve, which is the software, the program I used? Look up, type it into YouTube, and you want the shortest video possible that just says, this is what you're trying to do, this is how you do it, and so you just 
Watch the first bit, pause it, do it. Watch the next bit, do it, and et cetera, et cetera. In and out as quickly as possible and get on with the rest of your life. And so I think one of the reasons that people think the Bible is the wrong kind of book is because even as Christians, we think about it in the same way that we might think about the cycling Bible or the fruit and veg Bible. We have this instinct, and the instinct is right, that reading the Bible should help me to live my life. But then we come to it, and there's no index in the back. And so there's no section that tells me where I need to go to find instructions on X, Y, or Z. So maybe I'm considering moving house, or maybe I'm thinking about what job to do, or what career to do, or a life partner. And there's no section that tells me where to go. Instead, we find a really old text that's full of lots of stories about people who are nothing like us, living in a culture that is nothing like ours, doing things that are totally irrelevant for our lives, and not doing any of the things that would be relevant for our lives. So, for example, if you are a parent and you're wondering, when is the right time to allow my child to have their own mobile phone? And when should I allow them to start using social media? And how much screen time is too much? Then you're not going to find anything in the Bible that will answer those specific questions. The other reason I think people quite often think that the Bible is the wrong kind of book is because it is out of step with our modern day Western culture. If we were to read on through Psalm 119, verses 97 to 99 say, Oh, how I love your law, I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. And for lots of people, including Christians, we have no time to meditate on anything. You know, we've got all sorts of labour-saving and time-saving devices, things that didn't exist back when Psalm 119 was written, or back in the first century when Jesus walked the earth. We have all these things to save us time, but we don't seem to have any time. We don't have any time to meditate. We don't have any time where we can just sit and think, or where we can reflect, or where we can listen to what God might be saying. Instead, we rush from one thing to another, and we fill every second of our day with all kinds of distractions. And even when we read the Bible, we don't meditate on it. Because when we come to the Bible, we want it to tell us what to do. We need, want it to tell us what I need to know. And I wanted to do that as quickly as possible. But that's not the way that the Bible <coughs> was written. So is the Bible the wrong kind of book for us in the 21st century? You know, Jesus' issue with the Pharisees in our story that we looked at last week was that they were obsessed by the law, but they had no relationship with God. And relationships require time. You can't build a healthy relationship with someone without spending time with them. And so God wants us to spend time with him. And part of that process is meditating on his word. Whether we do that at home with a cup of coffee, whether we do it as we're out on a walk, whether we do it as we're in the garden doing some gardening, mulling over God's word, inviting God to speak to us. So, group work. So I'm going to invite, the, uh, in a moment, the young people just to come over here. And so you can have one group over here. Um, now, there are some, you should all have got, hopefully got a pencil. If you prefer to have a Sharpie, there's some Sharpies here. If you want a Sharpie, wave at me and Sophie will come and 
give you a sharpie. Uh, you've, at the end of every row, there is a white sheet with stickers on it. What I want you to do is to take a sticker and write your name on it, and then a number. And the number that you're going to write, you're going to write number one to five. So, and you need to listen carefully for this because the number might have a big impact on how much of this conversation you take part on. So if I'd love to listen, but don't ask me to say anything, if that's you, you're going to put number one. So then you can be in your group, but no one's going to expect you to say anything at all. You can just listen. Obviously, if you've got a group with all ones, it's not going to work. Uh, so number two, I'd love to listen, and I might say something, but don't hold your breath. So, uh, number three, I find it hard to hear what is going on, so I'm going to sit by myself and think. Now obviously there's not as many people as there are here sometimes, and so that might not be quite such a problem with lots of chatter going on at the same time. Uh, number four, so number three, if you see a number three set by themselves, just leave them alone. They're quite happy, they're thinking about Psalm 119, but they're doing it on their own. Uh, number four, I'd love to say something, but give me a moment to get it all sorted in my head. So some people, believe it or not, actually think without talking. It is possible. And so they might just be trying to work it all out. So just give them a moment. And number five, I'd happily talk for the whole time, so please shut me up occasionally to give others a chance. Okay, so if you're a number five, just be conscious that particularly the number fours, might be wanting to say something, and unless you shut up for 30 seconds, they're not going to get the chance to get a word in edgeways. Okay? So, so you've now got your badges with the numbers on, so you know what to expect from the people in your group. What I am going to ask you to do is the following. So you might need a Bible, either a paper one that's on the back, or one on your phone, is to have a look at Psalm 119, and I want you to choose two consecutive eight-verse sections. But anyway, when you've chosen your two sections, I want you to, to read it through, just get one person to read it through while you listen, um, and then uh, you might want to read it through twice, uh, and then answer these questions, uh, or think about these questions as we meditate on those verses. Is there something that I don't understand? And that's something you want to talk about in your group. Uh, what are these verses saying about God? Or what are they saying about God's law or God's words? And there's lots of different words used in, the, in Psalm 119 for that. It's decrees, precepts, commands, etc., etc. Um, or what is it saying about me? Um, is there a promise? Is there an encouragement? Is there a warning that I need to pay attention to? And is there something that God is saying to me? Okay?